Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. We've talked a lot about the unnamed girls in the Jeffrey Epstein case. The girls that were abused and then discarded, and nobody had ever heard anything from them ever again. We know that there are literally hundreds, maybe even thousands. I know that sounds crazy, folks. It really does to me even to even say those words. But there might be thousands of girls who have been molested by Jeffrey Epstein over the decades of his abuse. And even though we have a hundred or so survivors who have come forward, I think that there are many times that number of girls and women who were abused and victimized by Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, and the Core Four. But we haven't heard much from these girls. We haven't heard much, especially from the girls from like Eastern Europe and different war-torn countries where Jeffrey Epstein and Jean-Luc Brunel and others would get these girls and bring them to America. And I oh, it always ate at me and I, it always nagged me and I always wondered what about the unnamed girls and women in this case. Well, we have an article today that is uh, talking about how Jeffrey Epstein was abusing girls all the way up to his arrest. And again, how is it that he was able to continue with this lifestyle? How was he able to continue to go about abusing and molesting girls so brazenly? It is unconscionable to think that a sex offender like this could continue on with his ways, continue on with his disgustingness, and abuse more girls. It's one of the main reasons I was so fired up about the plea deal. There is no chance in hell that a guy like Jeffrey Epstein can be rehabilitated. Never mind a 13-month sentence where he's gone most of the day, six days a week, and not even in the jail. So don't act like he got out of jail and he was rehabilitated, or he got out of uh, jail and he was this new man who turned over a new leaf. Hell no. Monsters like this are wired the way he was. His proclivities were young girls and the, the abuse of women to exert power. That's what got him off. And he continued to do it all the way up to his second arrest. So, in my opinion, it is a big black eye for the Department of Justice and those who are responsible to bring him to justice. And it is also a gigantic, huge black eye on the legacy media as a whole. They should have been covering this and Jeffrey Epstein hard and fast for all of these years. They should have never let this guy get off the hook the way they did. They let him wiggle right off of the hook. And until the Miami Herald decided that they were going to try and go after Trump via Acosta, nobody gave a damn about this, all right? That's just a little, that's a hard truth that people need to start to understand. Very few people cared about this. And for all of these legacy medias to jump on, legacy media outlets to jump on board now and act like they have cared about the plight of these survivors and about this corruption, it's, it's laughable at best, folks, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. It's about time they hop on board. 100% about time that they hop on board. But the fact of the matter is, the media was derelict in their duty. They didn't report on Epstein. They didn't report do any exposés on any of these people that were around him. What's George Stephanopoulos doing at Jeffrey Epstein's house after Jeffrey Epstein was already a convicted sex offender? I mean, there are a lot of questions. What's Katie Couric, uh, Katie Couric doing there? We have a lot of questions that have not been answered. And, once again, the legacy media proves that it does not care about furthering the truth or getting to the truth. All the legacy media cares about is clicks and ad revenue. It's an absolute joke. And in this article tonight from the Daily Mail, we're going to hear from um, a 22-year-old girl who was forcefully raped and abused by Jeffrey Epstein after his prison sentence 
when he was still running the streets, being able to commit whatever sort of crimes he wants to commit, and nobody thought it was a good idea to send an investigative journalist to check out what had been going on for the last four or five years with Jeffrey Epstein? Of course they didn't, because like Nancy Pelosi's daughter said, when all of this first broke, some of our faves are going to be caught up in this. And we're seeing that come to light as we speak. Our article today is from the Daily Mail. The author is Ben Ashford. Headline, exclusive. Epstein accuser, now 22, breaks silence to reveal how pedophile raped and took her virginity aged 17 in 2015 as she believes he was abusing a second wave of young girls up until his arrest. And we know that he was still flying in to like the Virgin Islands and shit. He had a gaggle of girls with him. While he was on house arrest, he was abusing girls. So what makes anyone think that this sick, depraved monster would have just stopped abusing these young girls? Not going to happen, was never in the cards, and this is the sort of man who should have been chemically castrated in prison. And I'm not even joking around when I say that. There is no rehabilitation for people like Epstein. A 22-year-old Jeffrey Epstein rape survivor believes the warped financier, pedophile, was still abusing girls right up until his death, leaving behind a second wave of younger, of younger survivors too afraid to even tell their parents. That's terrifying to think about. A bunch of young girls that are still are too terrified to tell their parents what happened to them. And that's what he banked on, right? Epstein banked on that kind of stiff stuff. He understood the human psyche in that regard. He knew that the embarrassment and the, the ostracization that would occur for a lot of these girls if they came forward is too much. So he understood his demograph, right? He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what kind of girls he was looking for. And Marie Doe here most certainly fit the bill. The former model, who DailyMail.com will, will, will refer to as Marie to protect her real identity, says she was raped and molested during two visits to Epstein's Harry Potter-style mansion in New York in the summer of 2015. 2015, folks. All right, not that long ago. Jeffrey Epstein was refurbishing his whole entire image then. He was being uh, allowed back into polite society. All these people were rubbing elbows with them. Oh, I know, Jeff. He just had a solicitation of a prostitute charge. He's not a sex offender or anything. We weren't aware of what he was doing. Shut up, okay? You all knew. You all knew exactly what he was doing, okay? At the very least, you knew that those young girls had no business being around Jeffrey Epstein like that, okay? Epstein became embroiled in lawsuits, media storms, rape, and eventually an FBI investigation in his final years, but Marie feels that no amount of press scrutiny or law enforcement activity would have deterred the multi-millionaire pedophile from seeking out fresh victims. 100%. That's what I just said. This man should have been chemically castrated. He has no place in society. There's no rehabilitation for what he was. And the fact that he was allowed out of that jail that he was able to sign that plea agreement and then go on abusing girls should make the whole entire prosecutor's office culpable. Every single person in that office, uh, the state's attorney's office in Florida, everybody involved on the federal side, all of you, all of you are responsible and culpable for what happened after you failed to punish Epstein correctly. I believe he was abusing young girls right up until the day he was arrested, she tells DailyMail.com in an exclusive interview. There are likely to be multiple young victims out there who are still in their teens, perhaps still living with their parents and too ashamed and confused to speak out. That's just horrible to think about. But the fact of the matter is, you know it's the truth. How many times have we said thousands of girls here, hundreds of girls here, and we've only heard from a handful of those girls? So you know that there are more survivors out there who were abused by Jeffrey Epstein and his network, but they have not come forward yet due to whatever reason it may be. I know how it feels because I was one of them. I thought about suicide. I tried to cut my wrists. These girls need support before it's too late. 
they need to know it's okay to tell their stories. And that's for sure. If, and if one thing that the survivors can take from this, one thing that they, that, that could, they, they, that, that it should console them is that there are hordes of people that are willing to listen and that are willing to help you get justice. So if you're out there and you're listening to this podcast, get to a lawyer. If that's what, if you feel like you need to come forward, get yourself to a lawyer, prepare it properly, and, and then come forward and tell your story if that's what you think needs to be done. But really, for any of these girls out there who were abused by Jeffrey Epstein, it is just, it must be, I can't even imagine the burden put upon these girls. I cannot imagine living with that burden. After his arrest last July on federal sex trafficking charges filed in the Southern District of New York and knowing Epstein was in custody, Marie says she felt comfortable enough to contact the FBI and the NYPD to share her story. She is now among more than 100 survivors applying for compensation from Epstein's $630 million estate. And that's another thing. If if, if you were uh, abused by Jeffrey Epstein and you haven't come forward yet, now would be the time, in my opinion, to make sure that you get financially right when all of this is said and done. Because I don't care what anybody says, oh, it's a money grab. Nah, not this time, folks. Not this time. This isn't uh, he said, she said gray area. Oh, I was 19, she was 17 type shit, okay? This is some of the most powerful people in the world stealing the innocence from children and there is not a dollar amount that can ever fix or change that but reparations must be had for these survivors and for what they have went through Though the precise age range of Epstein's survivors has not been disclosed by the various law firms representing them, Marie is believed to be one of the youngest women to come forward to claim compensation from his estate. She asked to remain anonymous because she fears reprisals from Epstein's power- powerful friends and accomplices even now, nearly a year after the 66-year-old hanged himself in a New York jail cell, allegedly. And again, folks, even though Epstein is dead, his powerful friends are not. Douchey sons of bitches like Alan Dershowitz continue to harass and belittle survivors of Jeffrey Epstein. People like Dershowitz are the biggest bullies ever. Oh, it's easy for them to go after, you know, these survivors. It's real easy for them to try and malign them as prostitutes or evil people. Because we know exactly what he's doing, right? He's projecting. Alan Dushi Dershowitz, his time for sure is almost up. Marie was an aspiring 16-year-old model in the fall of 2014 when she snuck out to a bar in Manhattan to have drinks with older girls. She found herself talking to a glamorous 30-something named Madison. And before anyone, oh, 16, like sneaking out, what kind of life does she live? I guess you've never been 16. Because I did plenty of sneaking out. I did plenty of drinking when I was 16 as well. So, all you self-righteous people out there. Oh, well, what is she doing sneaking out of her house? Where are her parents? You must not have been a teenager. Or you must have forgot what it was like to be a teenager. Doesn't make somebody bad is what I'm trying to say. When they're a young kid and they sneak out to go to a bar. Or they sneak out to go to a house party. That's what happens. That's how we learn right from wrong. That's how we... uh, We learn everything in life by making those sorts of mistakes. So I don't want to hear, oh, well, she went to a bar when she was 16, so she deserved what she she had coming. That's basically what douches like Dershowitz had to say. Madison was everything I wanted to be. Beautiful, confident. She knew everyone, and everyone loved her, Marie remembers. When she started talking to me, I was just moon-eyed. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy she's talking to me. And that sounds like a typical 16-year-old, right? The cool girls in class want to start talking to you. They invite you out to party. They invite you out to whatever it may be. And you're, all of a sudden, you're starry-eyed, right? You're part of the cool girls club. 
And you could see how this could be very impressionable for a 16-year-old. Now, this Madison gal is definitely somebody that garners a deeper look into, by the way. The conversation quickly turned to a rich older friend who could introduce Marie to fashion industry Illuminati, including Les Wexner, the founder of Victoria's Secret. Again, 2015 now. Les Wexner is being used to facilitate Jeffrey Epstein's abuse of young girls. Can everybody start screaming that from the rooftops, please? Enough with Les Wexner getting a pass. Enough with the King of Columbus not having to answer for his relationship with Epstein and the way he enabled him. And for other things as well. Madison boasted that her wealthy pal could get Marie on the books at MC2, the modeling agency whose former CEO, Jean-Luc Brunel, has faced allegations of sexual assault spanning three decades. And again, MC2. How many times do we see MC2 pop up when we're talking about this case? It was a front company, okay? Point blank, period. They used it. Oh, yeah, they did some modeling work out of there. There's no doubt about that. But it was a front company so that they can continue to bring these girls in and abuse them. She said her friend Jeffrey was very rich. He sometimes takes a liking to people and he helps them. Marie Marie recalls Madison telling her. She didn't mention money or sex. In hindsight, it seems too good to be true. But her words were so alluring. It was like feeding candy to a baby. And that's exactly their M.O. These are polished people. These aren't people that are just showing up one day and they're like, all right, well, we're going to start trafficking kids and girls. They have a whole entire, you know, spiel that they kick. These people are, the idea is to get you comfortable around them, to make you think that everything's good. And then once they have your confidence, the abuse truly begins. The next day, Madison contacted Marie via Snapchat and asked her to meet Epstein for lunch at a VIP area of Manhattan restaurant La Esquina. It's a Mexican eatery in New York City. The upmarket eatery just happened to be next door to the headquarters of a top modeling firm, Supreme Management. Oh, just happened to be there. Just a coincidence. Has nothing to do with the fact that this girl wanted to be a model, right? Has nothing to do with the fact that Epstein dangled that dream in front of her, right? Nah, just another coincidence, folks. He was as charming as can be. He anticipated my questions. He knew exactly what to say, Marie recalls. I was enchanted. It's like he put me it's like he put a spell on me. And again, remember, we're dealing with a 16-year-old girl. A girl that sees all this opulence, all this luxury, all this money. It's easy to get drawn into that world, folks. Very easy. She agreed to go back to Epstein's Upper East Side home to finish up the conversation. It was nearby to a casting call she had scheduled for later that day, and Marie thought to herself, what would be the harm? When she reached the pedophile's hulking brownstone residence, it seemed to touch the sky. And that sentence is disturbing, to say the least. What could be the harm? Well, obviously obviously a lot could be the harm. And if the media would have reported what a monster Jeffrey Epstein was the correct way, how many of these young girls might have seen that headline and avoided him? She was amazed one person could live alone in the sprawling 20,000-square-foot residence where Epstein hosted numerous famous figures over the years, including Britain's Prince Andrew. Inside, Marie was unnerved by the foreboding Gothic decor, likening it, likening it, likening it to Grimald Palace from the Harry Potter franchise. He asked me how old I was. I told him I was 16, and he said I looked much younger, she recalls. He then took me on a tour, and I started to get scared, thinking I wouldn't be able to remember the way out. In Harry Potter, there's this hallway with shriveled elves' heads on it. He had a similar wall. There are also these velvet curtains with ghouls and screaming creatures hiding behind. There was a dark room at the house that had similar velvet curtains. What is she at? Anton LaVey's house, folks? This is just... This guy was a sick bastard, man. And what this poor girl went through, this little 16-year-old girl went through at his hands... I'll tell you what. I felt like every hallway was a maze and every room, a room of horrors. Marie remembers catching glimpses of older men and suspiciously young women who sipped champagne and talked among themselves in a lounge area as Epstein showed her around. 
She recalls several creepy paintings, including a six-foot portrait of a woman she now recognizes as Ghislaine Maxwell and a strange mural depicting Epstein behind barbed wire. So there was a room of older men and suspiciously young women who sipped champagne and talked among themselves, she said she saw. Well, we who are these men? Maybe she should... I, I would hope that they'd show her pictures of a bunch of different people involved with Epstein so we could figure out who these men were and then hopefully find the girls who were in the room as well. The same artwork has been described elsewhere as a bizarre depiction of the brief spell Epstein spent in prison after the 2008 sweetheart deal which let him avoid federal charges in Florida by admitting one count of procuring an underage girl for prostitution. And again, because of that, because of that charge, Jeffrey Epstein was able to leave jail and continue his abuse because the legacy media didn't report what a monster he was and the government failed to keep that monster locked away. It was inside the dimly lit room with red velvet curtains that Marie says Epstein began touching her inappropriately. When she recoiled in shock, he assured her it was routine for young models to do favors for older men in the fashion industry. He said something in Latin, along the lines of quid pro quo. I asked what he meant, and he said, You suck mine, I'll suck yours, she said. He laughed like an evil, wicked little laugh. A 16-year-old girl, folks, remember, that's who we're talking about here. Marie says her distress became so obvious that Epstein relented, letting her go, but not bothering to show her out of his sprawling home. She was confused and upset by what had happened, but presumed it was something that young models had to do to get their big break. And again... That whole entire thought process that models have to have sex with these sick, disgusting old bastards to get a job, that needs to be done away with. That needs to be done away with ASAP. And these modeling agencies need some sort of oversight. So when Madison messaged Marie in summer 2015 to invite her to a modeling party in Manhattan's trendy meatpacking district, she agreed to go. No one seemed to care that I was underage, said Marie, who had just turned 17. Madison was bringing me pink bellinis. She was on a mission to get me as drunk as she possibly could. Shocking. Shocking. Whoever this Madison person is must be subpoenaed. Marie soon found herself being ushered towards a black SUV waiting to take her and several other girls back to the $84 million Epstein mansion dubbed the House of Horrors. This time Epstein led her to a dimly lit massage room where he once more asked her age. I thought you were 14, he replied, with an air of disappointment. Marie says he ordered her to sit on a wooden cushion, massage table, before raping her. Imagine I thought you were 14 with an air of disappointment. Chemical, chemical castration was the only option for this man. I had my eyes shut. I felt like forever. It was extraordinarily painful, she recalls, her voice trembling. I scratched him. I asked him to please stop. He didn't stop until he was finally done. Then he just got up and left. The weird thing is that I didn't leave straight away. I went back downstairs to where the other girls were. For some reason, I kept expecting him to come and apologize. I was very young and naive. Of course he didn't. I felt broken. It was horrible, just horrible. I lost my virginity to him. Marie never saw Epstein again, but did hear from Madison, who only ever messaged via Snapchat, which deletes texts immediately after they are read several weeks later. And I know that there are a lot of other apps that people are using as well that are supposed to be encrypted in private. So I'm sure the technology has even become better for these kind of people to operate in the shadows at this point. This time, the, the mysterious procurer invited her to Little St. James, one of Epstein's two private islands in the Caribbean. She said, you're going to have so much fun. It's all beachfront. It's amazing. There are other girls going. You will love them. They'll be like your little sisters, Marie explains. I'm like, okay, uh, that's not normal at my age. I shouldn't even be going. I thought she was my friend. I wanted to warn her. I said, please don't hang out with him again, Madison. He raped me on top of a table. Within three seconds, she basically saw my message and blocked me. All right, so Madison is obviously in deep here. 
She aided and abetted in the abuse of this girl, whoever this Madison is. She procured this girl for sex trafficking and she must be apprehended and indicted. Marie confided in a girlfriend her own age about one month after the rape who urged her to go to the hospital for an examination. But like so many other girls caught in Epstein's evil orbit, she was afraid to go to the police out of fear he could hurt her or destroy her fledgling career. It wasn't until 2019 when another model contacted her to say the rich, silver-haired guy that they had both met several years earlier in New York was in the news. After his arrest last July on federal sex trafficking charges filed in the Southern District of New York, Marie says she contacted the FBI and the NYPD to share her story. And, and I'm glad she did. There are so many unnamed girls who have not come forward, who have been abused by Jeffrey Epstein and his, his friends. And there needs to be a reckoning at some point. Everybody who was involved in this must face justice. She is now more than among she is now among the more than 100 victims applying for compensation from Epstein's 630 million dollar estate. The predator was subject to two criminal indictments, one focusing largely on his activities in Palm Beach, Florida to 2008 when Epstein signed a controversial non-prosecution deal to avoid federal charges, the other citing crimes against girls in New York, Florida, and other locations between 2002 and at least in or about 2005. But civil lawsuits give a broader time frame for, the, for his perverted attacks and a January 2020 suit filed by prosecutors in the U.S. Virgin Islands alleges that Epstein trafficked, raped, and abused children on his private island as recently as 2019, the year he was arrested and later found dead last August 10th. And we, we talked about that earlier. His, his activity in the Virgin Islands never ended. He was still... He was still raping girls. He was still abusing girls the whole nine. And we're going to see, like Marie says here, a second wave of this come forward. I am almost sure of it. There's no reason to believe he ever stopped, Marie adds. Abuse was second nature to him. He didn't stop the first time he got arrested in Florida. In fact, he realized, oh, hey, I can get away with this. I'm invincible. I'm untouchable. 100% right, Marie. He most certainly did. He felt brazened by that, and he felt empowered by that. And when people like him get those feelings, it leads to bad things. Most of the survivors we hear about are in their 30s and 40s. It's been incredibly hard on them, but many of them are married. They have spouses. They have pulled their lives together. I, I, you're wrong about that, Marie. That's not the case, okay? There are a lot of these ladies who were children when Epstein abused them, who have lived very, very hard lives. Drug addiction, you name it. And I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a, a fair estimate to say that they've been able to move on with their lives because if you talk to the survivors themselves, you know that's not the case. But for the second wave of survivors, we are still young. It's still very fresh and we are still figuring things out. I saw other girls around my age, potentially younger. I'm sure he did some variation of what he did to me, to them. What happened to all of them? Have they told anyone? I consider my dad to be very cool, but, imag but I imagine having to tell a very traditional father about that, there's not going to be a lot of understanding. If nothing more, I want them to at least hear someone their age speaking out about this. And kudos to you, Marie. It takes bravery and courage to come forward and do what you're doing. And I highly suggest, if you're listening to this podcast, that you lean on the other survivors for support. Today, Marie has given up on her dreams of becoming a model and says she suffers from PTSD, suicidal thoughts, and panic attacks. She's been in therapy for the past year after finally finding the courage to tell her father about the rape. I don't know exactly what happened in Florida the first time around, but I know that had Jeffrey Epstein been apprehended and pro properly punished all those years ago, so many young girls would have been saved, she adds. The people behind the plea deal should feel an existential pain in their gut for what they've done. 100%. They are so culpable. And I said that earlier in this podcast. That's how I feel about this as well. All of these people that were involved, all of these people that helped with the, the plea deal, they're all disgusting, gross-ass pieces of crap. 
Sometimes Marie feels that Epstein's death has robbed her of justice. Other times she wonders if there are yet more chilling twists to come. I don't believe he killed himself. It sounds creepy and messed up, but myself and some of the survivors, we would like to actually see the body, she adds. My worst nightmare is that he's still alive and out there somewhere. Maybe one day I'm going to see a red dot come through my window and I'll be shot in the head. Are you kidding me right now, this poor girl? This is how she has to live her life, the fear she has to live in because of these sick, disgusting monsters? Well, Marie, up until now, you had nobody really there to help you out. Nobody to stand shoulder to shoulder with you as you navigate these waters. But what I can tell you is this. There are thousands of people that are willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with you as you come forward to bring truth to light. These rich assholes are ruthless enough to kill all of the survivors. All of us are on edge, even now. That's, you know what? She is not wrong about that uh, statement. That's for damn sure. Because I can tell you for a fact that not only the survivors, but sources in this case are still scared shitless to go on record. I've had four different sources not want to go on record because of reprisals of the powerful people that are still in action. People like Dershowitz, people like Indyke and Khan, okay? These are people that are very powerful, people that have a lot of pull and people that can really ruin lives. And you see it here with Marie Doe and you see it with the other survivors who lived in anonymity for so long due to the fear of Jeffrey Epstein and his criminal enterprise. But my message to the remaining faction within that enterprise and those that helped give them shelter and help them with their crimes, here is my message to all of you. 2020 is the year the predator turns into the prey. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that pertain to this episode are in the description box. All right, folks, I'll be back later on with some more. I hope you all enjoy your Saturday.